Wow, hi everybody. This is, uh, this is very stimulating. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of uh, conversations that have been opened um, that I want to continue all at once. Um, hmm. So first, just uh, thank yous. Thank you to organizers. Thank you to all the co-presenters. Thank you to all the people who have come from so far and wide. Um, I don't know, just uh, twinkle your hands if you wouldn't have been at the live one. If you wouldn't have gone to Earth Dance, twinkle your hands, just so people can see um, one of the many benefits that why we're on Zoom. Right on. Um, and in thanking people, I want us to thank not just ourselves and who is here, but like who got us here, whose work uh, created contexts and discourses and communities and relationships that got us here. Who were our dance teachers? Who wrote the things that we read? And then when we start to open it up further, we start to look not just at individuals who got us here, but the social movements, the communities, the cultures that got us here. So start to feel the roots, not just in your body into the earth, but in our community, that our temporary community that we are, and our relationship to history. And now let's also think about the future and thank the people in the future who are pulling us into this present moment, who need us to change so that we can do this together. And if we're going to go into the non-material and the non-human and the ancestors, let's pull them in. Who's supporting us to be here? But let's also call the elementals and be grateful for the universe and the building blocks of the world. Um, the plant beings, the rock beings. And if we're going to do that, then where are you? You're, most of you are in a building. The building's on the land. And where's the land? I'm in San Francisco. One of its many tribal names of villages in the San Francisco area is Yalamu. Yalamu is in the language of the Ramatush Ohlone. Um, that's a lot. If you're not from the United States or you're not familiar with this, this is a practice that we're getting from indigenous people, First Nation people, to acknowledge the land and its original people when we start things, to try to root ourselves in historical context uh, and not just the goodness of it, but also the struggles and the violence that have produced the moment that we share together. For those of you who don't know, I was born and raised in Canada in a mining town in Northern Ontario on the traditional lands of the Atikmishing Anishinaabe. So maybe take a moment to think about where you are, to think about all the beings, human and non-human, responsible for you to have this moment and think about yourself in the present moment pulled, pushed from the past and pulled from the future, holding a sort of tensegrity or counterbalance of weight in this moment, producing this moment, producing us in this moment. <sighs> okay, wow, this is just a lot. Um, yeah, how can the land acknowledgements that we do be a gateway to thinking about decolonizing our practices? So one of the things that comes up with all the conversations about white supremacy and racism and how the dancing emerges in contexts that are already structured by racism, it's like, well, one of the ways that we might undo that is thinking about, you know, the way that Sasha is bringing us in to think how do we queer spaces? How do we queer practices? Um, but also how do we make spaces less white? And one of them is the land acknowledgement practice is a sort of gateway to a lot of recontextualizing what it is that we're doing together. So that's that. I wanna do a, I wanna offer a little tuning dance just to dance for a minute. And I'm gonna propose that you can see your screen, but you're not in it and only your arm is in it. And go to grid view if you're not in grid view already. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. You can just watch the rest of us. But your arm in any way is in the form. And we're going to start dancing. And we're improvising with the hand. But you might see somebody else's hand and pick up what they're doing. You might counter it, respond to it. And we're just gonna go for another 30 seconds, dancing with people, 
Look for partners. And slow it down the last 10 seconds. All right, thank you everybody. Dancing. So uh, I really want to talk about what happens when we dance. Um, before I get there, there's just a couple things I want to say that have come up. One is um, I, neither in my um, video presentation or in what, what I'm doing right now, am I foregrounding my own gay and queer experiences. Um, but I want people to know that my, my queer fears and rage and the experiences of queer pleasure and collective power that I've experienced, they're lodged very deeply in my contact dancing and in my, uh, my activist body. And like many of the people um, here, all gathered here, my work focuses a lot on structural power and privilege, especially whiteness, masculinity, and class privilege. But the tools that I use for doing this work are rooted in all these other social movements, practices, discourses, and just a few of them that I would list would be um, anarchist and anti-capitalist movements, feminism and queer feminism, anti-racism, um, decolonial ethics practices, um, indigeneity, ecological. So a lot of social movements that I've anti-militarist, um, these things all sort of come through and sort of are talking to uh, my particular experiences as someone who um, was raised in an anti-queer environment and um, had to find my way through that. Um, I've been around the dance for a long time. I don't think it's always a power play to say that. So just to add a little uh, disagreement to what was just said. Um, when I was a young adult, I was for many years the only out gay or queer in any contact space, especially in leadership roles. And that was true in the US, in Europe, in Canada. Um, sometimes we forget that the person who instigated contact, Steve Paxton, is basically gay. So, and one of the things that goes on is that Steve was never out professionally and he came from an entire movement of, or like a cohort community of gay men in New York City who downplayed their queerness in any kind of public context so that they could be the heroic white superstars of American art. Um, and they did achieve that for themselves. And Steve is this sort of cusp person coming out of this like sort of white male heroic modernism and then sort of saying, I don't wanna be the kind of leader that my teachers were. So I'm not even gonna say that I invented the form. So there's all kinds of, in a sense, ways that he was a feminist or queer in terms of how he deflected leadership, but he's continually historicized as the founder of the work. Um, and his queerness is almost never discussed in any historical context. So just throw that out there. Um, there's a lot of talk about community and your local community. I think I'm one of many, many people in this symposium who, um, and maybe Twinkle, if you don't relate to a, a local community or contact as a community. Um, so it's not everybody, but it's definitely many of us. Um, and I think that my coming into the form queer has heavily impacted how I feel affinity or solidarity, even though I have many deep friends and long lasting friends who do contact. Um, 
And speaking of ambivalence, it's also even the idea about me identifying as queer. So um, it was at a queer jam that I first realized that I've basically aged out of queer. Um, I no longer foreground it as my identity. I'm interested in it as a larger discourse, but it's, um, I sort of came back to gay for many, for a number of reasons. Um, and part of that is within contemporary practices, when people are constructing a queer space, or especially a queer safe space, one of the last people that they expect to walk into the room is me. Someone who's 60, someone who's white, someone who's male, someone who's college educated, and someone who um, has built actually a career out of the practice. So that's just something else that I carry with all of these conversations. Um, Leslie pointed out some of the racial demographics of who we are gathered here. And I just wanted us to say it out loud what the gender demographics of who's gathered here. And that would be true in any workshop on consent anywhere. And that is that the white straight men would be in a minority. They're quick to teach the dance. They're quick to be active in many local communities. They're not as quick to organize and they're for sure not quick to go to a workshop on consent. Um, so it's, I just wanna just do, you know, praise hands to the women, the femmes, the queers, uh, the people of color who, who recognize the need for this work and um, the different ways that you all and we all are the, the ones who are going to make this change happen. And uh, a shout out to the straight white men who are here. Thank you. Uh, no extra brownie points, but I don't want to not acknowledge you. I want, I want us all in the room together. All right. Um, because I'm not going to open a whole conversation about race, I just wanted to mention that uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I spent um, a little over a decade uh, working on some research around white supremacy, whiteness, and the racialization of contact improv. Um, and that work is reduced into a zine of questions called questioning contact improvisation. And uh, if someone wants to just write that into the chat, that would be helpful, questioning contact improvisation. And you can buy that from my personal site or you can buy it from CQ. And um, I also will send them to any jam that you host anywhere in the world. I'll send you 10, 20 copies, whatever you want, and you can pay me later. Um, or not pay, whatever you need to do. All right, dancing. Um, I wanna talk about the dance itself, the duet dance itself as a potential site for change. So not how we organize the communities, which I'm 100% with, um, but actually how do we make change when we're in the duet dance, the actual practicing. Um, and I'm thinking about change in a big way. I'm thinking about change, transformation, and I'm also thinking of healing. Um, what else in my notes? I have a ton of notes how to think about the duet improvisation as a practice of both anarchism and magic, where anarchism is shared power and direct democracy and non-coercive relationships, and magic is a gateway into thinking about transformation, spellcrafting, witchcraft, healing, prayer, um, medicine, so. Dancing as magic and anarchism, dancing as witchcraft and healing and prayer. Ah. Okay, lots of words on a page that I'm scrolling through. Um, one of the people that I cited in my presentation was Octavia Butler, um, who is having a, an amazing second life right now. Um, I'm seeing the twinkles. Um, Octavia Butler is uh, now an ancestor and she made some very significant moves that are having a second life right now in social justice communities and also how we think about art. Um, she's an African-American science fiction and um, speculative fiction writer. And in one of her books, uh, there's a teenage girl, a teenage black girl who creates a religion and the and the religion has a central prayer. And the first two lines of this prayer are, everything you touch, you change. Everything you change, 
changes you. And I'm going to say it again, and I invite you to put your hands anywhere on your own body or a hand on your body. And take a breath and feel where the hand touches the body, or if you just want to press two legs together or an elbow to a knee, and feel the point of contact where the touch is happening. Feel how much is going on there. And now feel these words in the place of the touch. Everything you touch, you change. Everything you change, changes you. So I'm proposing that more of us uh, join me in bringing this mantra into your dancing. How would this change your dancing if the whole time that you were dancing, you thought, everything I touch, I change, and everything I change is changing me? Mantra offering. Uh, just so people know, I'm only going to talk for another few minutes, and then we're going to go into a breakout group of dancing and then a breakout group of discussion that will be at least 15 minutes long. So there's one other person I quoted in my video presentation uh, who helps me think about the dance itself as a potential laboratory of change, as a, as a place to practice change. And that is a German anarchist uh, who was active in the late 1800s, early 1900s, named Gustav Landauer. Um, I see people are typing things in. I'm not tracking it, but thank you very much. And if anyone knows how to write Gustav Landauer's name and you just want to put it in there, that would be awesome. I'll do it later. Um, but Gustav Landauer had this, um, this way of thinking about the state, right? So when anarchists think about politically, we think about the state. And the state is, for our purposes, we might be a short form way to say structural power, um, the coercion of um, the coercive power of the intersection of governments and corporations, perhaps, or how oppression is structured. So we're calling all of that the state. And Landauer proposes or suggests or describes the state as a condition, as a certain relationship between human beings. So what if thinking of the state instead of as some kind of like government object, what if the state is actually the network of relationships or a certain kind of relationships between people, a mode of behavior? And Landauer suggests that we destroy the state by contracting other relationships, by behaving differently towards one another. And this just really activated my approach to contact. Right, because I thought this is what many of us are doing in jams, in our classes, in our dances, is that we are contracting new relationships. We're behaving differently towards one another. Many of us were raised in one code of touch. I heard someone say that they grew up in a family uh, where there wasn't much hugging. Um, I've worked in the California university system with a lot of immigrant students, and they're like, my parents literally don't touch me. Um, we learned hugging off television. Um, I'm old enough that hugging was, did not happen in the first half of my life. And then my older siblings were bringing hugging back from their college experiences and introducing it to our family. So many of us who are in this symposium together were raised with one code of touch and we practice a different one in the dance. So here we are practicing in a sense, this anarchist practice of we're learning to contract new modes of being together, new ways of behaving with each other. All right, so then I was in this whole thing of what, what's back to my writing. So how do we dance the anarchist and, spiritualist in, and spiritual intentions where personal, political, political, personal are all interwoven and where a dance based in touch, shared weight and mutual listening can be a place of healing transformation, ritual, and magic. And the reason I want to talk about poetry and magic is I'm not just talking about the personal change. Like, like right now I can see Leslie or I can look up and see um, someone I don't know and I'm just looking and I can't even see, I'm just looking at your face. Um, I'm not talking about the dance where we enter and we are changed, but I'm also talking about the dance as poetry or spellcraft where what happens between us in this ritual space can affect all the worlds. 
right? So I'm thinking of dance as prayer, as, as having a larger impact than in the singular. And for those of you who don't believe in um, magic and prayer right on, then you can just start to think about the impact of the dance when you leave a room and how dance, how the, maybe the personal relationship transformation that you have in one moment can impact those that you touch and share in the world and that grows. So just ripple effects. Um, all right, um, people ready for a dance? Uh, what's a little tricky is that I'm going to propose a duet. Um, I think this is the only duet that's been proposed all weekend. So, um, and online intimacy and not getting to choose your partner can be awkward. So anyone who doesn't choose to go, you will be back in the main room. You'll stay in the main room and I will also be there and we will spend six minutes together. If you go into a breakout group um, because you agreed to be in a duet dance and it's not working for you, um, just acknowledge that to your partner. Just say, hi, this isn't working for me. And then click leave meeting and you'll come back to the main room. And if you are someone who um, is with a partner who left, one is we can think of Vivek and we can think about the gift of the no. That didn't work for someone and they gifted you that instead of dancing with you for five minutes, they said it's not gonna work and they left. So th you can thank them, um, even if it's just from your heart. But also there's no missing anything because what we're really trying to do is, um, what I'm trying to propose here is a, a, a slightly intimate encounter of the two person dancing. Um, and it not happening is also an intimate encounter. So you'll have plenty of material to take to the talking group. All right, what is the exercise? Um, it comes from a body of work called We Practice, the practice of we. And I learned it only a week ago from Sequoia Tom Lundy. Um, and I'm not gonna give all those references now, but I will make sure that they're in the uh, final document. In the duet, um, you're going to bring your hands up to the screen and you're gonna get pretty close. And then, but you'll only be with one person. And then you'll just decide as soon as you get into the breakout group, who's A and who's B. And so if I was A right now, I would start to move my hand and B would copy as best as they could. And then that will go for a minute and then the green screen will pop up and you might miss it, so just go for a minute and then B leads and A follows. All right, so that's basically what's gonna happen. It will be one minute of A leading, one minute of B leading, and then the next two minutes, no leader or shared leader. So very basic follow the leader exercise. A leads a minute, B leads a minute, you both lead for two minutes. If you miss the green screen changes, some version of that will work. Then the tricky part is the talking score for the last two minutes. The two minute talking score, you just alternate speaking. So I go, then B goes, A goes, then B goes. And A says, we are experiencing. And then I say whatever occurs to me, uh, our hands and faces. Then B says, we are experiencing, says whatever occurs to them. It could be a word, it could be two sentences. And you just alternate until the, there's maybe you can see there's 10 seconds and then acknowledge each other, say thanks, and you'll be thrust into the main room. I appreciate you bringing my awareness to um, the, the historical context, um, the history of, of the land that my body is currently on. Mm. I, I noticed you did this in your video too, and you used the word settlers. And I guess um, I, I, without knowing the history, uh, between the people that came here and the people that used to be here, I was noticing that certain words sounded too pleasant um, uh -huh. compared to what I believe the reality to be. So um, settlers just sounds very peaceful and calm. And I don't, I don't know because I have my research Cambridge's um, history. So I don't know particu the particulars of how things came to be. I would like to start um, thinking of the people on the land as I introduce it. And I think I may go for non-peaceful terms that don't sound so pleasant. Yeah. I think it's a practice that a lot of us are really, it's for many of us, we've been in it, you know, for me, it's like maybe three years in Canada and in New Zealand and Australia, you see, 
people who aren't indigenous who have been doing it for 10 and 20 years, but um, I think we're very new at it. So, and it's a big question here, whether to how much to talk about colonization, um, how much to talk about the violence of the settler colonial reality when we're talking um, and how much to just put the attention on the indigenous people. So I think it's great to think it out. And I, I just to say, I, there are also a number of African-Americans who have been putting a very particular spin on it and being like, it's not just enough to acknowledge sort of this tension between the settler and the indigenous in the land, but to also think about um, what is the afterlife of slavery in any piece of land that we're in. So um, to think about what black histories are in a place that you're in. And this, and this could be true in many places, maybe in the Southwest, you'd, you'd bring in you know, other kinds of information. So I think, I think figuring out what would have integrity for you to do a land acknowledgement is awesome. And we all need to work on it. Um, there's a great resource on the um, U.S. Department of Arts and Culture website. Um, if you wanted to check that out, Prince, um, it's usdac.com, I believe. And they have um, a group of folks, indigenous, native peoples that have been getting together to talk about this. And so there's a whole project there that has a link to it, as well as um, maps if you're interested in um, looking at uh, indigenous maps of um, the, uh, mainly the uh, North American continent. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I got so nervous yesterday, I didn't do any kind of acknowledge. <laughs> I'm gonna do it at the end. Um, Deirdre is part of a dance group called Dancing Earth that uh, hosted workshops in San Francisco specifically for the dance community to think about land acknowledgement. So it's actually one of the places that I, I get my practice. One more question, sorry. Uh, so I'm making an assumption here um, that you may have experienced a, a microaggression regarding your, your queer identity. Is that, is that something that I can say is true, that you may have experienced one? Oh micro. yes, many micro and macro. <laughs> when when you look at the uh, intention of the of the person that's interacting with you, um, and let's say you sort out that intention and you determine if this is um, unintended or if it's malicious in nature, um, I, I am curious what to say or what you would say on the dance floor if you're experiencing a microaggression. Hmm. I'm trying to build muscle memory language. Yeah. Um, I think my biggest responses are not verbal, but physical in that context. Um, I'm definitely really tough on guys who make gay jokes around me. Um, and that includes among each other, but in my presence, like, um, and that, and often the way that that manifests in a contact space is that when two men are intimate with each other, and then they suddenly go to their external view and they see that what they're doing outside of this room would look gay. Um, if they make some kind of comment, I, one is that I let them know that I'm there. like, if they don't know me and I'm quite out, if they don't, I let them know that there's an actual gay person watching them. So that's just one of the thing I do is like, I'm like, I'm in the room. Hi everybody, are we all back? Yes, we are. Um, Yeah, I think that um, with the time that remains, uh, I just want to go immediately to breakout groups where we can talk. Um, other than the closing, this is the last breakout group, so I don't want to put too much limitation on it or try to have you respond to a particular question. But whether you're coming out of the main room that some of us were just in or whether you were in the duet dances, um, I just want to drop these questions back in about the role of the actual dance itself as a potential site of change and as a, even a place to change the world from, like where the dance is a spell that impacts your life and the, and the lives outside of you. Um, so thinking about the dance as a place to work through, um, you know, whatever, I'll say anarchism, but you can say whatever your liberatory um, ethics might be, your liberation ethics might be. So. Yeah, what's happening for you in the dance? Where, where's your mind at with all of these topics? Um, but thinking about the actual dance itself as a potential site for change, healing, 
ritual, prayer, poetics, magic, revolution. And uh, groups of four will go for um, just the time that we have left. So um, whatever that is, Vivek, seven, eight minutes, give me the max and we'll go to the end. Like how do we destabilize certain kinds of authoritative uh, voices? And since I'm already like entering, I mean, you know, Richard asking me about my social status, it's like, it's a trip. you like, I am the oldest presenter in this group with the longest history in the form and um, a history of actually social justice in the form longer than almost anyone in the, you know, so it's these weird things. But so for me, part of the structuring, because I like the lecture format, but only I think the lecture from the white man in a sense needs to implode or break down from the, like it needs to collapse into itself. And so the falling into the, the dream sequences, the moving, the getting less coherent become actual like strategies ah. where, the, where what we know and we don't know are happening together or what is coherent and what is not coherent happen together. Um, I work a lot with a, another one of my mantras comes from Trin Min Ha, who's a, a philosopher, filmmaker, um, she's born in Vietnam, educated in the U.S., but all of her early research happened in Central Africa. Um, and one of her st statements is, all clarity is ideological. Hmm. Which would include even this sentence. And how we might, how we might think of ideology in that, in that sentence is um, that that you're not just saying a sentence, but your sentence fits into a worldview. And that's what makes it ideological. So if all clarity is ideological, then one position that um, a white man might take in presenting ideas, and actually anyone, but I think that if we're trying to destabilize power, there's an extra emphasis on it would be at the moment when I'm witnessing myself really depending on certain kinds of logic and clarity to then also let that collapse into either the physical embodiment space or into the mysterious space or even the space of ritual. So that just uh, word language logic gets destabilized by other kinds of practices. Uh, your personality, your character, the, the you, you, your public identity, you, um, it, it enjoys uh, destabilizing some of these um, ideas around privilege and your identity. So like you take pleasure from calling out these elements about your identity, I guess. Yes. Uh, pleasure. <laughs> pleasure is complicated. Um, I mean, I think that if I have a root personality, it's like, yes, I, I enjoy something about being a shit disturber, <laughs> but that's different from, like I'm quite ambivalent about over identifying, whether it's as a white man, whether it's about power, whether it's about being queer, whether it's, whether it's a dominant or a marginal, because I think that again, identity just gets ideological so quickly. So it's like, yeah, I try to not even stay consistent in something like, I'll say I'm gay, then queer, then um, non-heteronormative, you know, just, just to keep it moving. So. Yeah. How are you using the word ideological? What does that mean? When you, how are you, how is that? How I'm are saying you framing I, that? My simple version of ideological is if it fits into our worldview. So, because often we think we're just making some natural or neutral statement, but we're actually reinforcing a particular worldview. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is one of the things that comes up with some of the sexism and the racism in, our, in the communities around contact improv, right. um, is that people think they're just doing a thing, mm -hmm. but what those of us who analyze power see is that they're actually reinforcing a very particular understanding of power by that statement or that expression that they thought was just neutral or natural. I think, you know, for those of us in the States, it's like the settler colonial mindset has been normalized to such an extreme amount that we don't 
it's very hard to recognize. Right. It just seems the neutral. Yeah. I mean, I realize I can't see one person who's here, but no camera, but of the other four people who I'm in the room with right now, it's like, um, you have very particular, uh, you know, relationships to the settler colonial state and the slaver state in a way that I don't. So just noticing who's in the room. Hi, everybody. That is the end of my session. Um, thanks so much for your attention. Th thanks, thanks so much for, you know, wanting to think through these things with each other and try things out with each other. Wonderful. Thank you, Keith. Let's all thank, thank Keith. Keith. Thank Unmute you. your microphone thank and thank him. Thank you, Keith. Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Thank you thank for you. your wife. Uh, thank you, Keith. Thank you. 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 Th